Hey, Rich. This is Bruce and Rich coming at you with our weekly podcast. We're, uh, you know, trying to help you clean up and build up one week at a time. What do you think, Rich? You in? Yeah, let's, let's get started again this week, and we're going to have a, a good guest today, and then we're going to take some phone calls after that. So, uh, Bruce, like why don't you introduce our guest for today, and we'll get rolling here. We have Daniel Sheridan with our Parks Department coming in today. Daniel, are you there? Hey, yeah, yeah I'm here. Thanks, guys, for having me on the podcast. I'm really excited. Uh, Thanks for coming. Yeah, and hey, thanks for being thanks for being game to take your podcast to a video setting here at uh, here at Junior Theater, so people can see your beautiful faces. I love being out here. I mean, we got the historic buildings, we got a big courtyard to play in. I mean, what else can we ask for, Rich? That's right. I mean, hopefully, it doesn't hurt our uh, audience because you know we do have faces for radio, so this live podcasting <laughs> a little nerve wracking. Very true. Very true. Awesome. Can, you, you know, awesome. can the video just die? you know, during, and then, you know, maybe our, our citizens would be much happier. Uh, yeah, and just so, I guess, just so the citizens know, too, we're actually in our virtual teaching centers here at Junior Theater, where we offer virtual programming through the pandemic, which is exciting, but this isn't about Junior Theater. I talk about Junior Theater all the time, um, but, you know, I, I, I'm also a longtime citizen of Davenport. I grew up here um, and live here today, so, I'm actually really curious to learn. And, you know, first off, as we've been going to the other departments around the city, it seems that, um, you know, strong leadership and top quality service delivery seems to be something every department prides itself on. Uh, and I was just curious how this is the case for neighborhood services and community and economic development, how that all plays out for you guys. Yeah, sure, Daniel. So, you know, honestly, it, it is like we're two different departments, but, uh, a lot of what we do coincides together. So basically, you know, with neighborhood services, which I'm the head of, um, we look at everything from building starts to the eventual, if we have to go in and use code enforcement methods to bring a property back, or eventually, you know, if it's too far gone, you demolish it. And then so, you know, sort of with Bruce's team, there's sort of bookends on that. You know, we, we take existing structures or new structures and through our chief building official, um, our planners, we make sure it fits in the area of the community it's going. Um, and then it stays an active part of the community. So through code enforcement and making sure, you know, that it's staying, they're keeping up on building code rules, community rules, you know, keeping the exteriors or property looking good. And then, you know, like I said, Bruce's team, and he can talk more about it. They're sort of, you know, landing those businesses, those, those neighborhoods to our communities. And then at the end, they're sitting there and redeveloping it once the use change. So I, I'll let Bruce talk a little more about what they do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's a nice dovetail and that's why we've had such, such good luck uh, hanging out together. We end up doing everything from economic development. So we have an economic development manager that will work with small businesses to large businesses, um, businesses that are already here and want to expand, entrepreneurs that want to get started um, to attracting folks, um, businesses into the area. And then the other couple of divisions for community and economic development, my department, um, are uh, on the housing side. So we'll do housing rehab, housing uh, development, um, both for owner occupants, um, all the way up to large rental developments, um, some of which are going on right now in downtown Davenport. And then um, <clears throat> assistance for tenants too. So we operate section eight housing. And, and so if you um, have a need for anything, maybe in the housing realm, it's, it's worth maybe giving us a call. So. So if I want to start a business, you're saying I can't just build a building anywhere, essentially. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Really, really, yeah. You know, a lot of that, too, it, you, you talk about that, but, you know, so that may, maybe you start a business where it shouldn't be, and then code enforcement gets involved, and, and that's quickly where you got a great idea, you got a great business model, we get Bruce's team involved, and we find you the right spot to go, or we help you make mm -hmm. that spot the right spot. So, yeah, absolutely, you can't start anywhere, but, you know, we can make your, your dream happen there. Gotcha. So it's more, it's more than just enforcement. It's also being a partner with our residents. So like uh, along with that, Rich, you know, what are the main services you provide for the residents of Davenport? Sure. So our, our biggest, you know, we do any type of neighborhood nuisance. So, you know, if you, if you have that property on the block that just isn't quite maintained, right, or you're getting a lot of overflow parking or, uh, you know, debris, debris issues and that. So our enforcement guys will go out and address those issues, sort of reach out to the property owner, or the business that maybe isn't keeping up their end of a, a partnering neighborhood, a good a good neighbor, and we help them get into compliance and make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, we not only, you know, a lot of people think of rental inspections, so we're constantly just inspecting rental properties and they follow this property maintenance code. Well, so do our 
owner occupied homes. You know, we hold them to the same standard as a rental property and make sure that they're a good neighbor to everybody. Right. And, and I also heard that, um, I mean, through the grapevine that there was some restructuring in the planning division. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm just now honestly learning about the planning division, but what was the restructure and, and, you know, why was that, why was that a good approach? Yeah. So I, I think if you, if you look at sort of planning and zoning, it's, it's sort of twofold, but um, when you look at what we're trying to do in neighborhood development, neighborhood services is we're sort of that enforcement end. Does, does everything we do, do they fit where they're supposed to be? So, you know, a lot of what happens in neighborhoods or wherever, say somebody wants to build a, a structure or they want to change the look of their home, put a fence up, stuff like that. Part of that enforcement is a heavy handed, uh, not heavy handed is a good word, but um, a lot of cohesion with the, the planners, right? So your enforcement officers are working with the planners to make sure, hey, what fits or how can we make this fit? Your, your building guys are, are checking with zoning and planning for set, setback rules. So, you know, if you build, if you build a building, how far does it have to be off your property line? Or, you know, a lot of questions we get, believe it or not, is Danforth has an urban chicken program. So, you know, there's certain zoning rules to that, that you have to be 25 foot away from a neighboring structure or 15 foot away from your, your primary residence. So those sort of key indicators, when you have that team together, you get those answers quicker. It's more of a one-stop shop. So actually the planners came out to the public works building and they're sitting right next door to code enforcement and the building enforcement guys. So it just, it, gets a little quick turnaround for, for the builders and the residents to sort of do that. And then gives Bruce's team that time to really free up on driving those businesses here, getting that home builders assistant or, or, you know, the rental assistance type stuff. So it is that sort of, you know, just moving that one piece of the puzzle where maybe it fits and there's more interaction that way. Sure. We, we, back, we it used to be down the, the planning and development uh, staff used to be down at city hall and all of Rich's crew, um, and the engineer staff and the inspection staff were all up at Public Works. And so um, some of it just really was also physically being in that same space so that you can riff off each other and, and you know, it's not a phone call and they're not at their desk. And so, I mean, I, we're, I, we're hopeful that it's going to be a lot more productive than, than it had been. Not that it was bad before, but I think it can just improve that customer experience. Sure. sure. Well, and then Bruce, you know, what does community and economic development do for the city? And then obviously... Uh, impacting the residents, of course. Well, so again, you know, it's a, it's a wide range of, of things. What, what we like to say is we sort of assist people who want to do positive things. Um, so if you're um, looking to start your business, you know, there, there are assistance programs that are out there. Um, there are certain programs that assist you with property taxes. And we have an urban revitalization tax exemption program that's in certain geographic areas. And so um, we can help sort through that and see if that's the best program for you. Um, there, once in a while, we have a small business that comes along that is a great fit. They're creating new jobs. Um, we have a loan program for that, so it can be a loan in that case. Um, probably heard a lot about TIF. Um, sometimes TIF gets kind of a bad rep, but that's tax increment financing. Um, we don't do a lot of it. We're a fairly conservative city for that, but. Uh, a lot of times if you have a large industrial developer that's coming into town, Sterilite is a good example, that um, and Kraft, when they expanded, qualified for TIF assistance. And so we were able to provide that sort of tax benefit. So we do all of that with businesses along with, we partner with the chamber, <clears throat> we partner with um, folks like SCORE and um, they, uh, small business development um, uh, with the community college they spend a fair amount of time actually working one-on-one -on -one with businesses who maybe have the kernel of an idea, but they really want to see it grow. And so that's always a big piece. Um, they come out of that kind of then looking for where to land and then go through Rich's folks to try to figure out what property is zoned right. They can come through us and we can assist maybe with an incentive program, maybe through the state, maybe through the federal government, historic tax credits we can help with. Yeah. All of those sorts of things are things that we can just kind of help on the business side. And then switching over, kind of the same sort of thing on the housing side, we have developers who are looking to build housing and we have that same tax exemption structure type program or state programs. Um, for homeowners, we have programs, a lot of, a lot of our um, listeners out there may be aware the, the DREAM project is a very popular program. Our urban homestead program takes an abandoned house and we fix it up um, and then we sell it to a low income home buyer. And, so, and oftentimes that property was maybe a rental property to begin with. So, I mean, just a lot of, a lot of different tools out there and, and we can really just kind of help sit down with folks and see what's going to work best for them. 
So that, I mean, it, I mean, it sounds like just listening that it, it really has to do with, it, it improves quality of life, it improves economically, jobs, more tax revenue. I don't all know. The, yep. all, yeah, all of the above. Well, I, and you guys kind of alluded to this a little bit, I think, um, but as far as your departments working together, now that planning and zoning has moved, you know, how's that work? Maybe, maybe even a specific example of how that works could, could allude or could reveal some stuff for us too. Yeah, I, I think if you're looking um, sort of at programs or sort of with our merger and then just new programs coming up um, and touch on programs for, for Bruce, like Urban Homestead and Dream, you know, we do, as far as our department goes, we monitor a lot of city residential buildings, right? So vacant abandoned homes are, are are an issue in the city of Denver. We have a lot of them and programs like Dream and Irma Hose, they, they tend to move those properties from being vacant and abandoned to useful. So um, city of Denver, we use a program called 657A and there's a couple of different ones where we can get these, these properties that are abandoned and vacant. So there's no more homeowner interest in them. Um, they're owned by out of state people or there's back taxes on them and the city. So it's sort of a threefold department, right? We get involved with our legal department and they'll work through the problem. We'll identify these homes with Bruce, you know, we'll say, Hey Bruce, this looks like a good, good project house for home, urban home status. Not too far gone, solid foundation. We get with the city legal, they can go in and depending on what stage it in through 657 tax sales certificates, we can acquire that property as a city and then make it a project house. And then Bruce's team sort of goes in and, and uses his different programs to get that, that uh, property back and occupied and, and a resident on that block instead of just going to the old way of just tearing down homes, right? Because tearing down a home isn't going to build a community. So the more we can fix up, the better off it is. Yep, exactly. And, and it's the same, I mean, those historic tax credits we talked about too, sometimes those old homes like Rich was talking about actually qualify for some state assistance. So it might not even be a city program that has, uh, that can come to bear on it. We can actually maybe tap into a federal or a state program. So the more we're talking with each other and figuring out the best way to help a property along or a citizen along, you know, it just helps everybody. Well, and it's, yeah. it's been really exciting from a citizen standpoint to see in my social media feeds, families, I mean, they look like families moving into homes that have been restored by the city. That's, that's not only just looks powerful, I'm sure it's just powerful for that, that whole family. So. Yeah. I think it's powerful for that family, but it's also powerful for the block, right? Because right. you're sort of reigniting that block to where, somebody comes in, does a dream project or Bruce's team does a, does an urban homestead and flips that property. It gets other people on that block to motivate it to, Hey, you know what? We haven't painted our house in a while or, Hey, we could do a little more on our property. So you see that trickle down effect down the block of other people stepping up and sort of doing their own dream, right? Doing their own, their own urban redevelopment right there in their lives. So you see that spread out. So that's really what is awesome about those programs. And um, Bruce, I know, uh, I, th I think a lot of your programs have income requirements. I was just curious why why that is and, and how income requirements work. Uh, sure. Well, most of the funding, not all, but most of our funding comes from uh, federal uh, housing and urban development, U.S. housing and urban development. So um, they, Congress over the years has, has established certain income limits and they do change a little bit over time. But basically, they want to be able to help what they call low and moderate income, which is usually at or below 80% of median family. So, um, yeah, a lot of times we do have limits to who we can help. And, and that's been a challenge, even with COVID coming along. Some of the assistance coming out of uh, the CARES Act with Congress was to assist folks with uh, some of those same federal dollars and those income limits end up meaning that some people we can help and some we can't. And so we always like to kind of stress that throughout all our conversations with folks. It's not that we're not, I mean, we really do want to try to assist as much as we can. Sometimes our hands are just a little bit tied with the strings that come with it. But having said that, oh, there's just so much, yeah, there's so much that we can do. There's, there's different ways to attack uh, projects too that you might go at uh, physically rehabbing a property and then maybe down the line that property just becomes an asset to the neighborhood. So a lot of times there's different ways of attacking it, even though it might be a fairly restricted funding program. We, we try to get as creative as we can with it. So. so, I mean, you know, you kind of you kind of mentioned, I think when talking about where funding resources might come from, sure, it might be the city, but you guys, you guys or your team would hopefully direct even our citizens to state or federal funds. You know, what, what sort of money and I guess, does the government afford to us each year that we're able to serve citizens? Uh, a lot. Well, you know, so CARES Act, obviously, that's a, that's a great example. Um, I mentioned the National um, Historic 
tax credit. Um, it's been a, a, a great tool uh, in a lot of neighborhoods, the Gold Coast, for example. There are, are a lot of, of rehab projects that would not have happened without historic tax credits from both the state and the federal government. So a lot of times there's some complexity along that go along with those, but those are things that maybe we can help talk through a first time rehabber to figure out how they go about doing that. And, and then other folks know about the programs and all they need is maybe to push in the right direction. So, so yeah, they're, you're right. I mean, I think while we don't know everything about all the state and federal programs, we do try to kind of stay on top of that so that we can kind of keep people moving in the right direction. And, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, heaven forbid another derecho comes our way in 2021, but let's say something like that does roll through uh, Davenport again. Are, I mean, are you are you the team to contact? Well, good question. Actually, yeah, we're at least part of the team. Um, and I think Rich's uh, team as well and, and folks, I mean, there, there's a lot of folks and FEMA brings resources in the community, you know, usually in those state and, and well, federally presidentially uh, disaster areas. But yeah, for example, one of the things that we're doing with uh, some CARES Act funding that also comes through HUD um, is called Tenant Resiliency. Um, we're also doing a business resiliency program. Both of those programs are targeted at um, helping those who have been negatively impacted by COVID and are having problems, for example, paying their rent and staying in their rental unit. Um, same thing on the business side. If, if your business was going well and COVID hits and now you need to make some changes to your business, there was already some federal and state assistance, but this pandemic is ongoing, it's it's continuing, right? And so that need may be fairly great. And so what we're trying to do with our business resiliency is, is help those businesses that can recover from that kind of disaster. So it doesn't help in all cases and kind of like, you know, the, what I mentioned before, there, there are certain requirements and strings that don't always work. But I mean, it's a, it's a great tool to be able to use federal dollars that flow through us. And then we're not using city taxpayer dollars to assist our citizens. So. Sure, sure. Cool. Well, I, I mean, I think that's it for me. You know, I'm going to go ahead and hop offline. I, I know you guys have, uh, you usually do your call-in uh, section of the show where you hear from folks. So, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm going to turn this over to you guys. And um, thanks yeah, thanks again for having me. I appreciate it. This is great. This is great. Rich, are you, you want to take, uh, what do you think? Do you need, a, you need a break before we do this or we're good? No, I, I think we keep going. I think this keep is going. a nice, nice environment. And uh, I think... Uh, I think we move right to the phone call. I think we've got some calls lined up. So why don't we go ahead and uh, Bruce, why don't, you, why don't you patch us through there to caller one there and we'll, we'll see what's going on. All right. Uh, Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sir, we can hear you. What, what's going on today? All right, gentlemen, I love the show. So, hi, uh, my neighbor is, I mean, really annoying me. They, they rent the house next door and there's always garbage everywhere. They never cut the grass. The music is always too loud it's loud right now and it's the middle of the day and i just i don't like them living next to me so can you make them move somewhere else great well, well great question first off no no we can't make them move somewhere else i mean we can't can't always choose who our neighbors are but we you know we do want our neighbors to sort of make sure that they're good neighbors right so as far as if it, i think you mentioned they never cut the grass and there's always garbage uh, you can call out to uh our neighborhood services department and they'll send a code enforcement inspector out and what they'll do is they'll, they'll go ahead and verify that you know there is garbage and debris all over the place or tall grass and and they'll send them a letter letting them know they need to you know get the debris cleaned up and usually they give them a 10-day notice on that for the debris uh in the city of davenport we do a, a yearly notification that grass will be cut immediately or abated they'll usually put an orange sticker on the door letting them know you need you know the city crew is going to come and cut the grass um you know and then as far as the music goes, if it's during the day, there's sort of some noise level ordinances that are a little bit different during the day as opposed to night, but that may be something more that's a, a police department call for, you know, a, a neighborhood disturbance. But really, you know, Bruce, you know always, oh, go ahead, Bruce. Can we ask the caller, what, what kind of music is it? Yeah. Um, I don't even know. It's just so loud. I can't even uh, register it through okay. my, uh, yeah. The side check. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's a good question, Bruce, because it was a good local band. We might want to let that go, but. <laughs> you know, I was, there are noise, no, noise ordinances, and I would always check with the police department if they're in violation of that. But another thing we always recommend, it, you know, it, it, is it a rental property, did you say, or, or are they homeowners? There? It is. It is. It's a rental property. So another good thing to know is if you do have a rental property next door to you and, and you don't want to, you know, we always recommend, hey, have you ever talked to your neighbor? Maybe it's just a simple problem you and your neighbor can work out together. Um, you know, we found in the past that it, maybe it's an elderly gentleman or, 
or somebody who has trouble getting their grass cut. And maybe there's, you know, a young kid down the street that's earning some pocket money that could go cut their grass and maybe clean up the garbage for them. So we recommend that or find out who that landlord is, get a, get a relationship with the landlord because they're going to appreciate you looking out for their investment property. So if you can know that landlord and be able to give them a call and update them on things, or the city can do that too. We let the landlord know that we're having issues and, and they need to get those issues corrected. So, so where would I go to get these phone numbers? The, the website, the, the phone books. I mean, those haven't been around in a while. Yeah, definitely. So I, I always encourage, so the city of Davenport has a, has a great website. Uh, each department is, is on there with quick references to phone numbers, emails, uh, any way you, know, you feel better contacting the city. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I've got your first and last names now, so expect a follow-up. All right. Thanks sounds good. Calling. Sounds good. All right, Bruce, well, Bruce what, what do you think? We're going we're gonna to take another call here. We've got time for more. Well, we, got, we got time for several, I think. We're, All right, well, let's, let's go ahead. Let's see if we got another, somebody else on the line. All right. Um, yes, hello, guys. Thank you for having me. I, re I really love the show and what you do. Um, and I was just wanting to say, I was visiting my sister this weekend, and they have a cheesecake factory there, and it would just be mm, really nice to have one here in Davenport too. And we seem like a big enough community and, and I think we should get one here. So do you call them? Is that how that works? That's a great question, great question caller. Cause Bruce, I want to know where the White Castle is. <laughs> I think, I think we used to have one, but thank you caller. Um, actually you, you raise a very good, it's a complex answer, but you raise a very good question. Um, we can call, we don't do a lot of it. And, and here's why it's, it's often unsuccessful in terms of economic development, but um, let me back up a step quick. So um, there are very sophisticated folks out there called site selectors and most retailers like in Cheesecake Factory in particular, I know is one, they employ some fairly uh, complicated techniques to determine where they're going next. Um, and they also have you know, boards of directors and things that look at um, and CEOs that look at, you know, where they should locate um, certain areas of the country, maybe are the next um, frontier for them, those sorts of things. Um, but then when they narrow down to per perhaps a particular geographic area, they often employ a litany of, of factors, um, which can include everything from, you know, being a certain distance from a school or, you know, this much traffic on the road in front of them or, being located next to another retailer that's, um, you know, one of, one, um, let's say maybe a cheesecake factory likes to locate next to a, um, a, a Trader Joe's or something, you know, I don't know. They, they often have fairly sophisticated things they're looking for. As a result, most economic development around the country has, has stopped from those cold calling and just picking up the phone and calling them or emailing them. It's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a horrible idea, but generally that's not how they work. What we do instead generally is we um, make sure that our community has all of our maps, all of our data, um, has, has clear codes to follow like what um, our planning department um, uh, reviews so that when they're ready and they've decided that they're looking in our region, then it's an easy, easy move. They know, they know who to call, they know how to get there and we can quickly coordinate with them and, and get them what they need to be able to move quickly. So and the short answer is no, we don't really just call up Cheesecake Factory and, and try to get them here. But, you know, I'm not above popping in once in a while and, you know, sliding a business card across the desk. So, yeah, we'll see. So, so would you recommend, can I advocate to the company itself? You can. And in fact, that's been probably, I, I don't want to say definitively more successful, but if you've noticed around the country, sometimes there are businesses that will respond to Facebook uh, requests. And so if you have, you know, a quadrillion Facebook requests for cheese uh, cake factory to come to a uh, locality, they're more apt to listen to that sometimes I think than if, you know, Bruce Berger gives them a call. Um, so it's worth a try. I mean, at this stage, really all you're trying to do is get Davenport on their radar. And when it's on their radar, we can take it from there and, and, and move in, so. Well, all right, thank you so much. This has been very helpful. Thanks for calling. Yeah, Rick, excellent. Excellent. We got another one on? I, I think I think we got another one. Yeah. Let's take another call, I think we got time. All right. <clears throat> we don't have any sponsors, so we don't need a commercial break, so we can move <laughs> through our phone calls. 
Cheesecake was our, our sponsor for that last one. Honestly. Awesome. Awesome. Let's see. You can edit that in. <laughs> um, hi, I am planning to launch my business, and I'm wondering if you can help me. Sure. What, what's your business, sir? Um, so I've been building weather changing satellites in my basement, really just for friends mostly, but I think there is a huge untapped market, especially with the hurricanes and derechos and forest fires everywhere. So I'd like to rent space, maybe at the airport, to build and launch rockets for the satellites that people order from me. So this is basically cloudy with a chance of meatballs then. Um, I'm, a, I'm afraid I don't understand that. Okay, well, let's set up a time. We can, we can sit down and talk. Um, the, the, probably the key thing I would suggest is the Small Business Development Center with our Scott Community uh, College um, might be a great resource for you. We can talk through your business model. We can talk through um, what sorts of expenses you have on an ongoing basis. Um, what's the best locale? Maybe it is the airport. We actually have some room at our airport. We have some hangar space available. Um, and then when we get closer to financing from the city end, we can maybe reach out and kind of coordinate with the FAA and maybe NASA. And anyway, if all would go well, the city could maybe um, do some sort of a job creation type incentive. Um, but let's talk. Let's talk a little bit further. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. Well, that's good. I, th I think, uh, Bruce, we need to let uh, Nicole Gleason, public works director, know she might be an investor there. She could change the weather through satellites. Oh, you're right. Mother Nature would love yeah. that. Yes. Mother Nature, maybe she's the prime category investor for this one. <laughs> you're right. And the angel investors. Yes. That's right. All right. Is so time for one more? I think we got time for one. I think we can squeeze one more in. All right, All right guys. I'm going to dive right in. This question here is for Rich. There is another restaurant going up right up in my neighborhood, and they're rezoning. And I have four fur babies. How am I supposed to keep them safe with all of the traffic zipping and zapping? They are going to get run over or stolen. I just know it. My neighbors all think this is such a great idea, but I am not having it, not in my backyard. So how do I stop it? You need to tell them no. It is endangering my babies. Great. So yeah, so absolutely. So you said they're already, they've already put out some rezoning signs. So are you received a letter saying that this property was going to be rezoned. Is that correct? I, I did, but I couldn't believe it. Sure. So basically, if it's, it's, it's going to be rezoned, it goes to a hearing committee. It's called the Planning and Zoning Commission. And that's really your opportunity as a citizen to attend that meeting or, or these times uh, with COVID and that you can send a letter. Or, but, you know, we always suggest, you know, making some phone calls, letting people know what your concerns are, what, what's your reasonings for not wanting this restaurant or business, as you said, in your backyard. Or are there other neighbors that are like-minded? You said most of your neighbors think it's a great idea, but are other neighbors that have concern? And, and you have the ability as a citizen to go go to the planning and zoning meeting and, st and state your concerns and ask valid questions. Um, usually if it's a traffic concern or some type of concern like that, city staff, our, our engineering department has our traffic engineering in there. They'll look at this and they'll decide, you know, it doesn't fit better with adding extra traffic control or, you know, having different setbacks to, to protect your, your interests in your house. And, and as you said, your fur babies from getting, getting hit by a car or something. So you do have a chance to come out and say, Hey, here are my concerns. You know, whether you're a hundred percent against it or, you know, yeah, you like the idea of it, but you have concerns about it being right near your property. So I would, I would strongly suggest you, you go out and you attend the planning and zoning meeting and, and let, let those commissioners know what your concerns are. Well, and how would I find out about zoning and planning meetings? So like we said earlier, everything is on the website and that rezoning letter you got, you should have a contact number there to the planner who's heading that case. And they'll be able to answer your general questions. And it might be something that's already being addressed and you don't even have to attend the meeting after that phone call. Okay. Thank you for your help. All right. You, well, well, Bruce, I think we're pushing, pushing up on the clock here. We, we probably got the show today. I know this has been a great show. I want to thank Daniel Sheridan for coming on for this awesome site here out at the uh, Junior Theater and the, the entire campus at Annie Whitmire. And I mean, I, there's not I, the most fun I've ever had. I think Rich has been the Rich and Bruce Cleanup Build Up podcast. 
I think this, this, this podcast is exceptional. We'll see what the live video feed does to our ratings. Hopefully it doesn't hurt it. <laughs> we'll be back. We'll be back same time next week. Right, Bruce? Sounds awesome. All right. Great, buddy. We'll see you later. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Right. See you later.